So for the audience, I'm going to guide you. I will structure the talk into two parts. The first part is about the theory and my main argument. The second part is the case study of the eight relations of Myanmar and the related concept of donor switching. This means when I'm talking about this, I will roughly skip the statistics in the book. I'm happy to discuss them if you have questions during the Q&A. At one point in the talk, I will use a Chinese expression. I will immediately translate it back into English and I will contextualize the expression. The talk should take about 30 to 40 minutes depending on how fast I will go. So this is about 20 slides, it's not a lot. Okay, so this is the picture of the book. Now for some of us, this decade has been exhausting. I do not mean the pandemic or the, or the lockdown. Um, can you see my screen, by the way? I'm sorry, I think we lost your screen. Okay, the hold presentation. on. Can you see the... Um, no, okay. No, no, it's okay. Yeah. yeah, you have to tell me if it accidentally get kicked out because I don't know, right? Okay, yeah. yeah. Really? Okay, so this is slide two. Let me just repeat, right? Mm -hmm. The decade is, has been exhausting. I'm not talking about the pandemic on the lockdown. I'm referring to the phenomena of resurgent authoritarianism and the feckless response by liberal democracy. Mm -hmm. To those of us who care about liberal democracy, it seems like the liberal world order is collapsing and the replacement is an authoritarian world order. If that is so, there are some of us who are asking the obvious question. What is the future of a democracy in a world that is systematically redesigned to be safe for autocracy? So this book, the book that you see here, the book that you see here, is a response to our current darker age. It articulates a way to promote democracy in an international environment that is hostile to democracy promotion. These are the arguments in the book is not going to solve the crisis of liberal democracy, but it may buy some time for the liberal Democrats to get their act together. Ah. So, I have just set the international context of the book. I'm going to get right to it. I want to understand how eight donors, the one with the money, choose among the eight recipients, the ones who need the money, who to apply diplomatic pressure to. The reason why I'm interested in the dynamics of state-to-state -state bargaining in foreign aid is because I want to use that information to promote democracy. That is to say, the answer to the first question help us address the second question. The first question is the operational research question. The second question is the actual thematic question. What is my claim? I argue that foreign aid can still be used to promote democracy if we choose our recipients carefully. We should not give aid everywhere and to every country. We should be selective. Aid should go to the group of countries that lack the strategic and commercial attributes for reasons that I will go into shortly that render them less resistant to donor pressure. This is the group that is more likely to liberalize. This slide will address the question, why should my audience care? Why is this important? I solve a problem that aid donors have. Because foreign aid is a bonus income for the regime, recipients, the, the guys receiving the money, they might have an incentive to lie about their intention to democratize. They just want the money, but they don't want to democratize. So it would be very nice, a priori, to have the donors have a way to systematically separate between the recipients who are sincere they say they want to liberalize, they actually do it from the recipients who are merely engaged in cheap talk. They say, but they have no intention of liberalizing. Now this filter is empirical, is quantitative. So this is gonna be very useful because it can be applied to other types of bargaining scenario between states. Let me give you one practical example to apply this to Turkey, right? 
so that um, some people has been speculating that eventually Turkey would have to turn to the IMF to ask for a bailout. Now, if you understand the politics of IMF, sometimes the IMF impose conditionality on, on their money. And sometimes the conditionality, can you see the screen now again? Uh, yeah, it's yeah. bad. Yeah. And sometimes the conditionality is not, um, is not implemented. So these are the bargaining leverage. These, these, these are the concepts that would be useful even outside of my narrow focus of this book. Next point, there are also practical implications of my research. Keep in mind the domestic debates in liberal democracy. We are living in the age of austerity. COVID just makes it worse. National aid agencies, such as the US Agency for International Development, USAID, are under constant political pressure to justify themselves to the, to the skeptics. By identifying the cases that of the countries that are vulnerable to donor pressure, I help the aid agencies acquire cases of policy success. Now, this is important in domestic policy debates. In other words, I help the agency justify their budget. So now I'm going to um, I'm going to proceed. I'm now going to talk about the theory itself. We're going to start with the donors, then we'll talk about the aid rec uh, the recipients. So let's look at the donors' point of view. The general public, those who don't study foreign aid, assume that foreign aid is motivated by humanitarian concern. We know from empirical studies of foreign aid especially those derived from the selectorate theory, that this is simply not true. Donors have a variety of objectives that they seek to pursue with foreign aid. Donors can seek geostrategic concessions. Think of example, US aid to the ex-Egyptian president, Hussein Mubarak. The United States was buying with foreign aid Egypt's compliance with the Camp David Peace Accord. So it's buying peace with Israel. Donors can also seek economic concessions. Think of Chinese aid to selected African countries that happens to be rich in the mineral and oil resources that the Chinese economy desperately need. You can do a Google search and you search for the keyword Angolan model and it will give you very specific examples of this kind of foreign aid exchange. Or the donors can seek democratization. My theoretical assumption, one that is strongly uh, supported in the literature, is that the economic and security interests are more important to most donors compared to democracy promotion. So they say they want democracy promotion, but it's a lesser objective. Now I'm going to make one clarification. In the book, I distinguish between political liberalization and democratization. Mm. For the purpose of this talk, I use them uh, interchangeably because it's easier. It's just for narrative purpose. So let's talk about the difference between the two, right? Democratization deals with fundamental political change that ends up in a co consolidated democracy where the people are truly in charge. Political liberalization is more superficial. It deals with reforms such as the holding of multi-party elections that increase the accountability of the elites to the people. It may not end up in a mature established democracy. Empirically, most of the time, most donors, even though they say they want democratization, what they really mean is political liberalization. That's all they are willing to pay for. Now, that part is clear. I'm going to give you a visual aid. This is an illustration over time of US aid to Pakistan. You can get this by a simple Google search. Now, I want you to notice three trends. The first time period is during the Cold War. During the Cold War, United States needs Pakistan in order to fight in Afghanistan. So they give money to Pakistan. After the Cold War, Pakistan lost its strategic value because the Cold War is over. So the United States no longer need Pakistan. And I want you to notice around the year 1990, 1991, what happened to the foreign aid? 
it drops to almost zero, right? Because there's no need to give them money anymore. And this was true for about 10 years until about 2001. Because in 2001, there was a September 11 attack. The United States wants to fight the Taliban in Afghanistan. And the one way to get into Afghanistan is through Pakistan. Suddenly, the United States needs Pakistan again. And notice around the year 2000, there was a massive spike in foreign aid into Pakistan. Notice what's happening. This is not because of the developmental needs of Pakistan. Pakistan is poor throughout each of the three time periods. Yet the amount of aid it received varies. The inference is that the variation is driven by the need of the US for Pakistan. This is donor driven. This is not recipient driven. Now, just because we have donors who want democratization, it doesn't mean the recipients will comply. Why? Because the recipients are strategic actors. They have priorities of their own. That's why you need to consider how the recipient will react. Well, what do they want? Democratization is politically painful for the autocrats, which self-respecting autocrat wants to give up power if they can help it. So now the question becomes, what happens if they want the money, but they don't want the conditionality that comes with the money? There are several possible responses. What I, what I investigate in this book is to look at the option where the recipients turn around, make a counter offer to the donor, giving some other concession instead of democratization. This is a bargaining scenario. The recipient with the strategic and commercial attributes that donors want should have a much easier time getting the money compared to the recipients that don't really have that much to offer in the first place. So this may mean that they can get the aid without democratization. Now I understand this is very abstract. I'm gonna give you two examples for you to compare and contrast. In 2013, there was a military coup in Egypt. General al-Sisi overthrew the elected government of Mosi. Immediately after the coup, United States government came under pressure to cut off all foreign aid to Egypt in response. Just to give you a context, there's a law passed by Congress around 1993 requiring the automatic suspension of all foreign aid to, from the United States to any country that suffers from a military coup. Despite this, at that time, the government in charge is the Obama administration. The Obama administration refused to cut off aid, which is worth about $1.2 billion annually to Egypt. In fact, the White House consistently refused to call the takeover a military coup. Because the moment you call a military coup, you have to apply the sanctions, right? And the White House didn't want to do that. By contrast, in 2006, there was a military coup in Fiji, which is a Pacific island. There, the United States was decisive. It cut off all foreign aid. It insists on democratization, citing the same law. It conspicuously refused to apply with regards to Egypt. Mm. So the question becomes, why is there such a disparity right, in response that the US react very differently to the two countries? The simple answer is this. Egypt is an important US ally in the Middle East. To put it bluntly, it is too important for the United States to risk democratization. By contrast, the United States have no particular need for Fiji. Therefore, the US can afford to indulge in a call for democratization. So my theory, is capable of explaining how the Western donors react differently to two ideal types of recipients. One group, you may help, it may help you to think of them as the Egypts of the aid recipient world. They have bargaining power. They can resist donor pressure. 
So in the book, for the purpose of statistical analysis, I'm going to call this group the primary recipients. The other group, think of this as the Fijis of the eight recipient world. They don't have much to bargain with. They find it harder to resist donor pressure. I'm going to call this group the secondary recipients. So I hope to have persuaded my audience that by now you realize that not all recipients are equally important to the donors. My claim is that we can use this insight for democracy promotion. We should filter the recipients by their leverage. The autocrats of primary recipients know that they are valuable to donors. They have leverage against the donors. So when you put diplomatic pressure on a primary recipient, it's more likely to fail. Now, the same pressure, when you apply it on the secondary recipient, it might work. Why? Secondary recipients don't have that much to offer that is attractive to the donors. The autocrats of such countries have less leverage. Therefore, this is the group that is more likely to liberalize with democracy aid when you put pressure using foreign aid. So what is the take home argument for my audience? We should calibrate our aid allocation strategy to emphasize the secondary recipients if you want to be effective with democracy promotion. That's why the subtitle of the book, the, the book, the, the subtitle is called Liberalization at the Margins. It encapsulates the gist of my argument. So now you know my argument. This concludes the first half of the presentation. We are still not done. This is halfway done, right? Now, now that you know the theory, I'm going to give you an overview of the rest of the book. Now, in the book, I have three chapters when I conduct statistical tests of the theory. In simple language, I use cross-national data on foreign aid and regime type. I'm going to skip the statistics. Instead, I'm going to use the time, the free time, to discuss the case study because I think that might be of more interest to my audience. I have two case studies in the book of the eight relationships between the donors and the recipient. The first case study is a comparison of the aid dynamic of Egypt and Fiji. Now, Egypt is a representation of a primary recipient. It's very influential. It has a lot to bargain. Fiji is a representation of a secondary recipient. It has a harder time bargaining. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this case. It's in the book. The second case is on Myanmar, a country with over 50 years of military rule. Just a note on the name of the country, right? So um, for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to use Myanmar and Burma interchangeably, right? Because um, we, can, we can talk about the naming of the country because it's heavily political and contested. So the case study for Myanmar, the time period that I cover, generally speaking, is 2008 to 2015. And now I'm going to start the second half of the talk. So let's talk about the theory, right? The argument is that the salience of the recipient affects how susceptible they are to donor pressure. Case study of Myanmar is useful because it doesn't fit the need category. Myanmar is not a primary recipient. Myanmar is not a secondary recipient. It's a case of a country with moderate salience. So it's neither here nor there. So this is useful because it's a realistic case, right? It's closer to the real world. I'm now going to talk about how the two donors think about Myanmar. How do they value Myanmar? Okay, first one is the American. As far as the Americans are concerned, Southeast Asia isn't that important. After the Vietnam War, the United States gradually lost interest in Southeast Asia. 
In fact, the literature describes Southeast Asia suffer from a benign neglect. They're within quotation, this is an actual quote, right? Now, in Myanmar, one key event is the 8888 incident. So this, the, the numbers refer to a specific date. What happened on this date? The Burmese military, the Tatman Daw, basically massacred the pro-democracy protesters. Right? So this was the crushing of the democracy uh, protesters. In response, the Western donors, including the United States, imposed sanctions on Burma. Back then, it was still called Burma, right? Within the United States, Burma isn't that important. Burma is considered a boutique issue, right? The, the quotation is right there. Sure, the human rights community, they may care about Burma, but the majority of the policy makers in the United States are indifferent, right? Because the United States have no particular importance, with, uh, doesn't uh, accord that much importance to Burma. And precisely because of that, they have no problem punishing Burma with economic sanctions and putting pressure on Burma because they have nothing to lose, right? The case of China is different. The first point is that China has a growing economy. Because the economy is growing very quickly, China has a large need for energy. One reason why China is interested in Burma is because it's a source of hydroelectricity, right? So you can build dams to sell electricity. The other point is that the Chinese economy has a very large voracious appetite for oil. And 75% of Chinese oil imports have to sail from the Middle East. It has to sail all the way around the Straits of Malacca. And that means it sails around Malaysia, around Singapore on the way to China, right? 75% of them goes through the Straits of Malacca, which is in Southeast Asia. This means the oil that flows through the Malacca is actually outside the control of the Chinese Navy. This is a strategic vulnerability for China, right? In Chinese policy circles, they describe this as the Malacca dilemma, right? They are worried about this. So the location of Burma allows the Chinese access to the other side of the Malacca Straits, an uh, outlet into the Indian Ocean. So having Burma as a client state solve the Malacca dilemma from the viewpoint of Chinese strategic thinking. In sum, Burma has slightly more value, some economic and strategic value to the Chinese compared to the Americans. Now, let's look at it from the viewpoint of the Burmese junta, right? So imagine I am the junta, sure. The West puts pressure on me, but that's okay because I can turn to the Chinese for patronage. Right? That means under pressure from one side, I turn to the other side. On the one hand, it looks like the problem is solved. There is a Chinese expression. So I'm just going to speak into Chinese and then I will translate back to English. Right? So the Chinese expression is Dong jia bu da, da si jia. Okay? In English, the direct translation is if I cannot set up shop in the East, that's okay. I can set up shop in the West. So this is the idea that the recipient can shop around for alternative donors. To analyze the process when the recipient actively play one donor group against another, I'm going to call it donor switching, right? Trying to play one group against another. At first glance, it looks as if Burma has the leverage. After all, it can donor switch from the West to China. That's the conventional understanding, right? In the book, I argue that's not actually accurate. That's not factually true. That's not necessarily true. Now, I'm going to help you understand this claim. To understand this claim, I'm going to draw an analogy from the sanctions, economic sanctions on another country, in this case, Iran, for the purpose of teaching, right? So for many years, Iran is under sanctions from the West. 
So Iran responds by selling its oil to countries like in the East, for example, India and China. Now, for the sake of argument, let's assume a barrel of a price of oil on the international market is say, let's say 60 US dollars per barrel of oil. Now that is the price the West is willing to buy for the, for the oil. That is the price that Iran wants the Chinese to pay. The problem is, can you see the clip, right? So the problem is the Chinese knows that Iran cannot sell the oil to the West. So therefore they refuse to pay the price. They make a counter offer to the Iranians to buy the price, the, the oil at a lower price, let's say 40 US dollars per barrel. Now the Iranians are not happy about this, it, but he understands it has very little leverage. He has no choice but to sell the oil at a lower price because it cannot sell the same oil to the West. So what's happening here? The Chinese side realize it has leverage with, the leverage lies with China, not Iran. And they are using the leverage to secure a discount on the price of oil, the asset that they want in this case. So the light blue arrow represents the increased pressure from China back to Iran. Now that you understand this, I'm going to apply the same logic to our case study. So look at the figure again. Now, this is the case study. This is a triadic, which is another way of saying it's a three-way relationship. When the West put pressure on Myanmar, Myanmar tries to play the China card against the West. So it turns to China. The problem is, Myanmar is under sanctions by the West. So the Chinese realize it has leverage. The question now becomes, how might the Chinese apply the increased leverage back upon Burma? So the light blue arrow here represents China applying more pressure upon Burma. So in the book, I talk about the concessions that China extract, um, extracted from Burma for its privileges, uh, for its patronage. So um, I, I went into details in the book chapter. Now, the point you want to take note is that I'm just going to highlight three, and these are the politically costly concessions that Chinese side demand from Burma. First, China intervened into the peace talk between Burma and the, the Burmese government and the various armed ethnic group along the periphery of Burma, especially along the Sino-Burmese border. There are two types of intervention, one diplomatic and one military. First, China basically forced the Japanese delegation out of some of the peace talk. Right? So this is a China-Japan dispute, but they took it out on the Burmese right? and the Burmese were not happy about this. Second, there was a military intervention as well. It has been alleged that China is actively arming some of the ethnic armed rebels within Burma. Now, this is a strong allegation. So let me be specific about, about which group I'm talking about. The, in, the full citation is in the book, but some commentators believe that China is arming the United Wa State Army known by the acronym UWSA, right? United War State Army. Now, for those of you who are familiar with Burmese history, the UWSA is the successor organization to the Burmese Communist Party. During Mao Zedong's time, Chinese foreign policy was very aggressive. It actually have a record of funding and arming multiple communist parties throughout Southeast Asia including the Burmese Communist Party. Um, again, it, it depends on how much you know about the history. The Tatmando, which is the Burmese military, had to fight ethnic rebels that were armed with Chinese weapons. And some of the weaponry of the rebels were more advanced than the Tatmando's weaponry. And I think that the leadership of the Tatmando, some of whom have actually fought in a lot of the, of the early wars, I don't think they have forgotten or forgiven this fact. 
So there's some amount of lingering resentment. Second, there is the economic penetration of Burma by China. The entire Burmese economy has been somewhat pejoratively described as a adjunct of Yunnan. Yunnan is the province across in China. The economic penetration fueled a resentment by the locals. When I say locals, I mean the dominant ethnic majority in Burma, which is the Burma people, right? They were quite resentful against Chinese traders and Chinese businesses. Again, I gave you the literature, it's cited there. Next one. There is also the controversy over the Maison Dam project. This is a very large hydroelectric dam that is financed mainly by China and the night, over 90% of the hydroelectricity when completed, it was supposed to be sold back to China. Now, that dam has many environmental and local costs on the, um, on the Burmese population, right? So the negative externalities of the dam when it is completed has galvanized a social movement within Myanmar against the construction of the dam. The junta was so worried about the social, out, um, the, the protests, right? Because there was a lot of resentment against the dam. They repeatedly asked the Chinese government to delay the project. Now the Chinese government in their arrogance, they assumed that Burma has no choice but to listen to China. So they repeatedly deny the Burmese request to delay the construction of the project. Things got so bad that Tian Xian, Tian Xian is the military dictator that was the transitional government just before Aung San Suu Kyi. So this was the military junta, right? Tian Xian actually had to suspend the dam project indefinitely. <coughs> so now let me turn back to the theory. You should see a diagram now. This is the other side of donor switching. If China has increased leverage, it should use the leverage to get more concessions on Burma. That's the first blue line that you see. What can the junta do if they don't like the Chinese demand? Well, they could turn back to the United States. That's the second blue arrow that you see. To use back the same Chinese expression, Dong Jia Bu Da Da Si Jia, right? If I cannot set up box shop in the east, I can turn back to the west. So if the junta doesn't like the increasing demand from the Chinese, they can donor switch back to the United States. So that is clear. The next question, just because Burma turns to the US back for aid, it still have to offer something that is of interest, that something that is of value to the United States. Just keep in mind, right, the, the book we are talking about was um, written at the time when the US administration was the Obama administration. So this was some time ago, right? As far as the Obama administration is concerned, Burma isn't that valuable. The only concession that the Americans might be interested in is the political liberalization of Burma. So under sustained pressure from the West, from 2008 to 2015, Myanmar undertook a rapid series of political reforms. So the details of the reform are in the book, right? That means it's in the book. But the main point is by 2015, it culminated in a general election where the National League for Democracy, the NLD, this is the party led by Aung San Suu Kyi, won by a landslide. That means they won just about every seat there is to contest, and much to the shock of the military. One more point. At the end of the chapter, I took care to point out the limited nature of the reform. There were real reforms, but the reforms were taken by a junta that is in a position of strength. That means they did not reform because they were weak. They reformed because they were powerful. They were in a position to dictate the pace of the reform. So the reform is a means from the junta's point of view 
to acquire defensive leverage against China. Because full democratization is not the end goal of the regime. It's unlikely, I speculated at that chapter, that we see a mature established democracy at the end of the process because the process was not designed to bring about democracy. The process was designed to restore leverage against China. So let me now turn back to the theory. Analysis of aid tends to overemphasize the agency of the aid recipient. We assume that the aid recipient has leverage so long as it can find an alternative donor to fund it. My case study suggests that it is not that simple. Donor switching cuts both ways. If the aid recipient can try to manipulate donors, aid donors can also play the same game. If we are going to give agency to China as the alternative donor, China as a rational actor has its own interests. We should expect China to increase pressure on the aid recipients. What is more, under some conditions, the donor switching can backfire on the recipients themselves. So what are the, some of the policy implications? My first point is with regards to small states. Please keep in mind, right? Most of the member states of ASEAN, Association of Southeast Asian uh, Nations, most of the state, nine out of 10 of them are by definition small states. Only Indonesia is not a small state, right? So a lot of the small states, they like to play one major power, United States, against another major power, right? So this research suggests that donor switching has its limits. Secondary recipients in Asia are not that important to both China and the West. They may try to donor switch, but it's theoretically possible. They still end up in a position of weak leverage. This is the group that, according to my theory, may be nudged towards democracy. Democracy promotion in the democracy promotion need not be a lost cause in Asia. It's harder in Asia, but it's possible. Now, I suspect my audience might be more interested in Myanmar, not because of the aid or the history of Myanmar, but because they are interested in the coup, the recent coup and the political fallout. So please keep in mind, my book is written in 2020. And actually, let's be honest, right? The, the case study, the chapter that is written was written in 2015, 2016. That was five years ago, a long time ago, right? So strictly speaking, the events of 2020 is outside the scope of my inquiry. And it's a different research question, right? Because what people care is whether the coup will succeed or not. That's not my research question. My research question is about democracy promotion, a different question, right? But that said, with that caveat, I ask that you understand hindsight is 2020. So I'm going to make three sets of speculative comments. First one, the West and the Muslim world have a tendency to overemphasize the Rohingya issue. Right? They, when they analyze Burmese politics, they have a tendency to look at it through the lens of human rights abuse. I don't think that's the correct way to understand the politics of Burma. There's a lot of internal politics and Burma is a complicated place. Now, if you are interested to read out more, I have another article where I talk about the politics of persecution. So forgive me, I will show you the website. You can quickly take, about, uh, take a look at it. It's on my CV and I can show you the website later. So I'm going to switch my screen. So um, Samiha, can you tell me whether you can see the... Um, yeah, sure. Okay, so can you see the website? Yes? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, okay. So I have a two-part article where I explain how is the Rohingya issue playing out within Burmese politics. And I explain why Aung San Suu Kyi 
as a political leader, have zero interest in helping the uh, Rohingya uh, the Rohingya at all. Actually, all the main actors, Kamando, the different ethnic groups, they all persecute the Rohingya. It's because of the internal Burmese politics, right? So if you're interested, you can go to the website and you can read out on this. By the way, this is actually a student-run journal at Ashoka University. So it's not peer review. So I don't want to overplay the website but I contributed the article because it's my way to contribute to the mission of my school, right? So since I'm working there, right? So now I'm going to switch back to the presentation slide. So tell me if you can see the presentation slide, right? So yeah. yeah can you see the slide? Okay, yeah. good. Okay, so let me continue. Second point, it's not even clear why the Tatmando, that means the Burmese military, chose now to launch the coup. Let me explain, right? Since 2008, the 2008 constitution, which is the current constitution of Myanmar, is written by the army. The constitution was completely lopsided. The constitution gave army, the uh, Burmese military complete autonomy. It's extremely high. It's one of the more, it's a, that constitution is a very extreme document. Let's be clear. The constitution gave the Burmese army a protected budget. That means the civilian government cannot reduce the salary of any of the soldiers. They can't touch the budget, right? The constitution gave the army the right to choose its own leaders. Not many people know this, right? The army does not report to the government. The army has its own internal uh, structure. They report only to themselves. And actually, even the police in Burma reports to the army. They do not listen to Aung San Suu Kyi, okay? No. And the constitution gave 25% of the seats in the Burmese parliament to the army. That means the army don't even need to go to election. They automatically win 25% of the seats. It's an insane constitution. It's a perfect constitution to keep the army in power for all intents and purposes, except the former sense. The Tatmando is already in charge. The NLD has very little actual power over the army. That's one of the key reasons why Aung San Suu Kyi doesn't want to pick a fight with the army because you will lose, right? So that begs a really important question. Why seize power when you are already in charge? And it's not clear why the army is doing this, right? I am not sure what's the reason. I'm going to speculate. One explanation being circulated is that Aung San Suu Kyi overplayed her hand. She alienated the West by supporting the persecution of the Rohingya because this is domestically popular with the Burmese population, right? And because she lost the patronage of the West, she tried to compensate by seeking the support of China. She invited Xi Jinping to come and visit uh, Myanmar, right? Now, I suspect, I'm not sure, I, I suspect this alienated the Tamando. If my account of the transition is correct, the reforms are a way to seek leverage against China. I suspect the leadership of the Burmese military is not very happy with an increased Chinese influence over Burma because that's the purpose of the reform in the first place, right? Now, I'm just saying this might be one reason for a military coup now to restore the leverage of Myanmar vis-a-vis -vis China. I'm not saying that's the main reason. I'm just suggesting this may be one contributing factor. It's a speculation, I'm not sure, right? Now, whatever the result, as it stands right now, right? Aung San Suu Kyi's credibility with the West is rather low. Many of the people that have consistently spoken up for her since 1988, when she was first in prison and so on, are a lot more silent now. They are reluctant to speak up for her. I think they realize that, I mean, I hope they realize that it is a mistake to assume that Aung San Suu Kyi will protect democracy in Burma, even if she is restored to power. I should point out, she has been in power for several years she has a track record of governance now. That means there's a fiscal record of what she did. She behaved like an authoritarian leader, right? And frankly, if I'm going to be blunt, she's not very competent, right? Worldwide, let's be clear, let's conclude some, uh, let's wrap this up. 
Worldwide, the current trend is against democracy. This suggests the coup may succeed. I note that Burma is not that important as far as the West is concerned. The West have, some of them at least, have shown that they are willing to put pressure and sanctions upon the junta. So there, is, there, are, there are two different forces here. Until we understand why the army choose to launch a coup, we may not understand how resolved the army is in trying to stay in power because you don't know the reason why they did it. So like I said, the situation is still developing. I, I don't know. Right? It's, we need, there are some questions that are not easily answered because it requires insider information, which I don't have. So I hope I have persuaded you to take a look at my book. right? It is under open access, which means that Ashoka University has paid to make the book freely available to all of you. If you want to download it, you can just Google the book title and you will find my publisher website, which is Routledge. And in one of the links, you can download the PDF of the book. And the alternative is to go to my homepage, right, which is the bansingtan.com. One of the links of the homepage will get you the book. If you want to buy the hard copy, right? So um, you can email me and then I can share a promotional code with you that will get you a discount for the order in case you want it. So thank you very much for your time. It's a great pleasure to talk about my book. I'm very grateful to Boasichi University Asian Studies Center for hosting this talk.